Good morning, church family. It is so wonderful to see all of you here. Friends, basketball players from the Drazen, family over here. This is church. Isn't it wonderful to gather on the Sabbath to just be amongst God's people? It is truly a gift that we're given as a community. This morning, whether or not you are single, you're dating, you're married, you're unhappily married, you're a grandparent, <laughs> or somewhere in between, I know that God has a word for you, and I think that this message and topic is so important as we enter into the beginning of the school year on this campus, but also around our country. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to consider thoughtfully what God's word has for you as you think about this. So would you pray with me now? Merciful Father, Jehovah Jireh, provider of salvation, grace for our sin and all we could ever ask or need. Jesus, we come before you this morning needing to slow down. Slow down the noise in our homes, work, and the voice in our head of a world in pain, encouraging us to medicate as it believes is right and good. Jesus, speak into our lives this morning a word we desperately need to hear. Soften our pride as we listen, and Father, speak in spite of me. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen. amen. I love my family, especially my wife and kids. Elena and I have a great time with these three that we have. Petra just started soccer this last week in the church league. She's four years old. Man, she is squealing, running around the field, not really sure of what to do fully, holding the ball more than kicking the ball. But she's having a great time. She didn't want to go home after practice on Thursday night. No, Tata, no. We got to go. We're going to come back. Don't worry. Little sweet Mila, one year old, she's just so excited to just smile at us in the morning when we see her just to cuddle next to us. And then our three-year-old John Philip, so full of life, joy, laughter, going from one end of the house to the other and always leaving a little trail behind to tell you that he was there. This one morning we were making breakfast for the kids and there's that scary feeling when you just don't hear anything. And I'm like, Elena, where's John Philip? Oh, no. I had just been in my office. I opened my Bible. I left a pen out. And I ran to the back. Sure enough, there was my Bible open to Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way they should go. <laughs> and they will not depart from it. And then with that smile and pen in hand, that little graffiti artist had marked up the whole page. Kid, I'm not training you up to be a graffiti artist. My goodness. <laughs> They're precious. They're awesome. You know, but as much love as I have for them, I also have a deathly fear. A fear for the world that they're in and a fear of the lives that we live. Two-parent home, we don't have a lot of margin not a lot of time to have conversation around the dinner table. We got to go, we got to go, we got to go. We got things to do, bills to pay, things to accomplish. The kids need this. We got to finish that. And it seems as though there's so little time for us as a family to really enjoy being in one another's presence. And the problem is, as margins get little, depth of conversation develops into unhealthy eating habits and Late nights after the kids go to bed, it's almost like this revenge to sleep. No, I'm not going to sleep. This is my free time finally. So you scroll on your phone with that blue screen for a while. Is that the way life was supposed to be? Is that it? Well, maybe we can kind of almost give a little bit of an apology. Hey, listen, it's the modern life. That's just the way it is. And if you left here today just simply understanding that God is for you, that his mercy is upon you, and don't beat yourself up over it, man, you will have left with a good message. But 
But friend, I can't let you be so naive as well to think this shallow understanding is all there is. Now, that's just the way it is. Accept it as a fact. That's all that you can think. Because I'm reminded of a poignant, piercing passage in 1 Peter 5, 8 that says this. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I'm going to talk to you this day. I want you to respond back to me. Amen? Come on, amen? amen. Hallelujah. There we go. You see, we need to be a little bit more alert, a little bit more sober-minded as a community. We need to understand that the unconscious thoughts and actions of our minds are shaping who we're becoming and who our kids and families and relationships are like. Some of you go to work and you have kind of a, just a flat demeanor there that shapes your peers and what they think about you. Now he's just chill, man. Just leave him alone. Others of you walk into a room with a little bit more anxiety about you. Just a little bit unsure about this and that. Others of you, you got a little bit more passion. All of these different ways of relating to each other. And then there are the habits that we just kind of go by. You know, they say that 75% of our actions and thoughts are literally habits. We don't even think about it. It's so annoying because at home this last a couple weeks ago, we had, you know, thrown out all the trashes. And I did the one in the kitchen. I threw away the trash and then all of a sudden... I forgot the one really important thing, to put the trash bag back in, a new one. And that whole morning, six times, I open the door and throw in trash without the trash bag in there. There are habits that shape who we are and who we become and who our children end up becoming. The question we need to ask ourselves is, are these habits making a significant impact in kingdom value? Are these habits and the ways we run and do our life, are they actually making a difference to make better Jesus followers? Make people who are more soft to the Holy Spirit as he speaks. Making us more in tune with the things of God and the cares of this world. Are our habits shaping us into better followers of Jesus? There's a really great book that I've been reading lately, and I can't encourage you enough to pick up a copy of this. Habits of the Household by Justin Early. This is his second book. First one, he won an award as Book of the Year by Christianity Today. And this one is just as good and so important. Practicing the story of God in everyday family rhythms. And he writes in it, listen to this. My habits are forming me into a certain kind of parent. My parenting has formed my kids into certain kinds of children. We are all together forming each other into a certain kind of family. There's no escaping habits and formation in the family. We become our habits and our kids become us. The family, for better or for worse, is a formation machine. So I want to ask you a couple questions. You saw it there in the meditation. We are all creating certain cultures in our homes. And so at the outset of our time together, I want you to ponder your life for a moment. Consider the first question. How do the habits, the unconscious thoughts and actions of your daily life help or hinder your relationships, your profession, the walk with Jesus? How are they impacting all those spaces? Second question, how do the habits that you have created in the culture of your home help or hinder the people and church around your family? Michelle Anthony, in her book, Spiritual Parenting, and Awakening for Today's Families, just states this very plainly, and she says, don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. You see, the habits of our life we sometimes assume are fine. But a lot of times the habits of our life, the way we wake up, I don't know how many of you, if you're like me, oh, it's morning, where's my phone? Oh, it's uh, evening time, where's my phone? Oh, it's a free moment here at the cash register, where's my phone? 
oh, it's one of those moments that I just don't want to listen or talk to anybody. Where's my phone? Those have shaped who I have become around others. They've shaped my interactions with people. There I was, my very first church after graduating seminary, probably almost 11 years ago. A wonderful place. There were no positions here in Loma Linda where we were living. Elena started the medical school. And the conference office said, Philip, there's a church that would love to have you, but it's 70 miles away. I'll take it. Grew to love that people, that congregation. It was wonderful. And I was preparing a sermon that Friday evening, and it was getting late, and I just could not land on a good illustration. And I just prayed a prayer. I said, dear Lord, please help me to find some way to grab the attention of your people, that it would connect their hearts to your word. Amen. Oh, boy. Did God answer my prayer. Let me tell you the dream. The dream was I was in a home, a beautiful mountain home with all of these church families. It was an expansive region of the country and there was a mountain range nearby. The horizon was open. It was just beautiful. It was glorious. And all of us, these church families kind of milling around, kids running all over and just parents talking to each other. And then all of a sudden, someone noticed far in the distance that looked like a creature. It started to come closer, and, and someone said, hey, that's a lion. Oh. And then in the horizon, there were more than just one lion. There were now a couple, now three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, boy. There were many. The phones started to come out, and people started to take pictures. The kids ran to the window with their eyes wide open, and then the phone clicks. We always like to get a picture of something, don't we? I got to remember this for Instagram. I got to put this up somewhere. I got to remember this moment. And people taking pictures, just enamored with the beautiful creation of God's nature in this ferocious, large animal. Now the children started saying, hey, Mom, the uh, lions are all over the yard here. Are we okay? Oh, we're fine, honey. We're inside the house. Don't worry. But there was one thing that I saw that others couldn't. There in my dream, I saw that the back door was cracked open. A young lion walked its head through, poking around, curious, and then its whole body, followed by that one, then many. And the whole place started to turn into a pandemonium as chaos emerged. Lions running and attacking the families I knew. And that fear gripped me and I started to run, trying to find any place I could not getting into a storage room. I climbed up to the top shelf and I was startled awake just as this lion's paw was coming for me. What are you to think with something like that? What was God trying to say? What message was in that? And then I thought, boy, I don't know if there's any message. What did I eat last night? (laughs) Those burritos were really something. But I believe that that dream reminded me that Christian families today are under attack. I don't know how many of you realize that, how many of you understand that, but in the last decade, the world has changed so drastically much. And when I look at my life and and our family, I feel the attack. I sense it around me. I know shaky marriages, unhealthy home lives, personal choices from people that they're just not proud of but don't want to tell anyone, don't want help. You don't have to wonder why some of the challenges are happening in life because why there is an enemy. There is a lion named Satan who is looking for whom he may devour. And when he can take out the family unit, the building block of Christian society, he can take out a lot more after that. And friend, I don't stand up here with any pride of any kind because if you saw my life and if I would invite you into our home sometime, you're like, Pastor, you might need a cleaning lady, you might need this, you might... How are you talking to your kids like that? My goodness, do you have time for that? 
I come up here as a fellow servant of God that is with you. In the same trenches, in the same battle, in the same spaces, I understand. But man, are we under attack. And some of you are like, Pastor, I don't really relate to that. That's fine. Maybe you don't feel the oppression, but maybe you feel the pressure. The complete exhaustion that you work yourself into. The anxiety of the societal demands upon you at work, at school, in your relationships, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your grandparenting, in just praying for your children that aren't even maybe here. The countless kids that could be in these pews and the young families that just aren't. It's a sobering reality. Listen, family is truly a blessing, and God's word tells us it's a blessing. But what do we do when our foundation is cracking beneath the blessing? The psalmist David in Psalms chapter 11, 3 says, when the foundations are being destroyed, what what can the righteous do? Families throughout Scripture beginning in heaven, moving into Eden, and then going from Genesis all the way to Revelation, tell of an imperfect family. Families who, man, if you were around and they were part of our church membership, you would wonder, uh, Pastor, you know, I know we haven't had a business meeting in a long time, but I think these people got to go. There's, there's deception, there's thievery, there's murder. I mean, are you sure you want them around? The Bible tells of families who look a lot like our own. Some worse, some better. But these are families that are struggling, and I think the scriptures portray that because that, that's life. Life is struggle in many ways. But also God's people cannot be so blind to assume that that is the way it should be just because it's broken. Sometimes we kind of just fall into that, hey, that's the way the world is, bro. Just, just, just live with it. Just live with it. Just live with that reality. Hey, listen, don't rock the boat. Don't. But I want to tell you, I think that we need to consider those families once again. And maybe a family that we haven't really talked a lot about. You're wondering, well, what family could you talk about? Man, they're all messed up. I want you to consider with me a family that we don't really discuss kind of as a model example to us, but a Roman centurion and his home. Usually we talk about this story and this person in when we're trying to give people biblical eating standards. Hey, look at Genesis, I mean Acts chapter 10, look at chapter 11. They weren't talking about pork and unclean foods. It was the Gentile. But I think there's something really important that we'll miss when we don't talk about those first eight verses and who exactly this person was. And so I want you to open up your Bible, pull out your phone, don't scroll on it, no, no, but take a moment to turn with me to Acts chapter 10 and verse 1, and look at this with me. It'll be on the screen as well. We're going to look at the man and the place and the habits that emerge from this section of Scripture. And it begins with a profound, actually, place. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. Just stop right there. There is a lot going on. You see, Caesarea was 30 miles north of Joppa, where we end up kind of needing to get a little communication going on later in the the story. But Caesarea was really kind of a no kind of significance of a town until Herod the Great rebuilt it. He rebuilt it in a significant way, honored Augustus Caesar, named it after him who was the adopted heir of Julius Caesar. He rebuilt the walls. He added a huge amphitheater. He created a temple dedicated to Rome and its gods. He then also brought in many, many military soldiers to come and protect his newest creation, a beautiful aqueduct that piped in fresh water into the city. But he also had to protect Rome's assets in the city. Because this also became a place of taxation for Rome in that Judean province. And he also needed to protect the grain trade. You see, grain was taken out of Egypt and then 
passed through the region of those seas and then taken to Rome. And so there were a need for a lot of soldiers, and that led to a lot of fights. You see, there were more military men and families there present than there were the Jewish people. The Jews hated Caesarea. Most likely, this is where the wars of kind of the 66 to 70 began. The riots emerged here with the war in Rome, of Rome. And many, sadly, almost 20,000, it's said, to have lost their lives there in the war. The Jewish people had to mourn the loss of their family and friends. And so Caesarea, while it was a no-good town at one time, it became the provincial administration of the province. It was a showpiece of Roman culture. It was a place of fashion and gods and wealth. It became a significant place. And it's here in this place that our story goes on. But now let's talk about the man, the man named Cornelius. It says he was a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Wow. Wow. This man named Cornelius was a centurion. Centurions oversaw about 100 Roman soldiers. Some commentators say even more than that. Cornelius, the text also brings out, was not just of any regiment, but kind of one of those regiments of an individual who were archers, and they were people who were kind of protected at a distance. But also, Plebeus, ancient writer there, tells us that the centurions were the solid bedrock of the Roman military. They were the steadfast ones who would stay in place when literally everyone was running. They were taught to stay till death. A centurion was also someone who had worked up the ranks, who showed to be a man of maturity and good stature, someone who could hold the honor of many men and follow commands. And so in the Jewish, in the Roman eyes, he was someone who was looked up to. And even in the Jewish eyes, the text brings out that it says that he was devout, God-fearing. And when it talks about that, it isn't talking about Christianity at this point. You see, the strange thing, this guy had converted to Judaism. Wait a minute. Judaism? Cornelius' family becomes one of the first Gentile converts to the Jewish faith in that Roman province endearing himself to the Jewish ethics, moral code, even keeping the Sabbath and worshiping the God of the Old Testament. And though many of the Jews would still call him unclean, he still was unlike any Roman officials we might ex anticipate. Those Roman officials would have worshiped at the temple there in Rome, of the temple of Rome, would have sacrificed to the idols, would have enjoyed the lavish lifestyle, would have done everything else but Worship the God of the Old Testament? You begin to realize Cornelius is someone who is hungering after truth. The first habit that we see, a life-giving habit that Cornelius portrays to us in this modern society, is that we need to test the world around us and its values. And if it makes your family better people, by living by them. The Russian exile who had spent a long time in concentration camp Alexander Sholozitsyn. He writes in a Templeton Prize address in 1984 the following. Today's world has reached a state which, if it had been described to preceding centuries, would have called forth the cry, this is the apocalypse. Yet we have grown used to this kind of world. We even feel at home in it. What would he say if he was around today, 40 years later? He would say the world has come to an end, probably. 
But you see, the first habit of our man, Cornelius, was that I'm going to test what's around the world around me. And if it doesn't bring our family hope and meaning and blessing and a more God-fearing spirit, I don't want anything to be with it. He tested his own Roman culture and found it wanting. What do we do? Do we evaluate the values of the culture around us? Do we make decisions to choose contrary to what they're proclaiming? Or do we just kind of go along with it? Hey, listen, everyone's doing it, bro. What are you making a big deal? Come on. New Testament theologian Richard Longacre, he writes in a commentary on the book of Acts, he says, we must understand that Cornelius is a Gentile who realized the bankruptcy of paganism. And he sought the worship of a monotheistic God to practice a form of prayer and lead to a moral life, apart from any necessary association with Judaism. Probably we should view him as a pious, devout, and intensely religious man who might have known very little about the Jewish religion, but in his own way gave generously to those in need, to the people, the text kind of brings out in the Greek, literally the Jewish people. He was literally giving money to the people that he was supposed to watch over. From the text, we also see something pretty profound. Something that I know some of you are going to look at me and you're going to say, ah, pastor, come on now. It says here that all his family was devout and God-fearing. All. Literally, in the understanding of the household is the better word to be treated here. His entire household. Households in that Greco-Roman world would have been not just his immediate family and children, but also the servants and kind of military aides and their families. So you're talking about the servants, aides, and all their families coming to faith and being God-fearing? Yeah. Now, I know some of you would point back the finger, wait a second. In that patriarchal society, whenever the leader of the home comes to faith, the entire family has to decide to follow that same faith. I, I see you. Okay, touche. But the text also tells us that the entire family themselves followed in a God-fearing way. You know, you kind of talk about your own kids and sometimes they're like, do you guys, you know, want to go to Sabbath school? Oh, no, I don't want to go... You, could we do a little family worship? Oh, no. My kids, you know, the first time we started doing this more regular time of prayer before bedtime, usually it was a recitation of the dinosaurs. I'm trying to pray, and John Phillips, and the dinosaurs were biting. And John Philip, wait a minute. Come on, man. That's all right. I'm not saying he's not God-fearing yet. But here in the text, it brings out the reality the family also practiced. And it also brings out the fact that later on, it shows that not only did the family practice this, but others saw the faithfulness of this man, this home, this group of family that said, we're going to walk after the Lord. And so the second habit we see, this life-giving habit, first is, hey, don't just blindly accept the culture around you. And second... It is practice your faith in such a way that those closest to you have no doubt about the genuineness of your life and devotion to God and fellow humankind and especially your family itself. Let the way that you live really portray that, man, you believe this, you live it, you know it, and you want your kids to find that. You want your friends to find that. You want your parents to find that if they don't know the Lord. You know, social scientists talk about generational faith. I've had the time to read a few books on it over this last year. And what's interesting, what they bring out in study after study is the fact that when you see faith generation being passed on, this, this idea that, wow, one generation is passing it on and then another generation passes it on, it comes from parents who practice their faith outside of the normal expected places. Church, Christmas and Easter, Christers, different times when you expect kind of, oh, well, you have to do that because you're in public. But when kids see you love Jesus, worship God at home in the everyday life, 
they start to say, hey, this person really believes this. When you could lose it with your spouse and instead you choose forgiveness and love and affection. When you're going through a hard time and your kids are like, dad, I can't believe what you're going through, but man, I see your faith. I see what you're standing for. I see that you're not trying to fight and get revenge. Wow. When your little kids don't even know who God is, look at how you love them. They see God in that. Further, we notice that God spoke to Cornelius very specifically. He could have brushed it off, and we're going to capture this right here. What did God kind of tell Cornelius? There through the angel in verse 4, Cornelius stared at him in fear, and what is this, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial to God now. Send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that happened, and he sent them to Joppa. We capture here that Cornelius very easily could have just been like, hey, that was kind of weird. I'm not going to go along with that. Uh, he could have brushed off God's command. It's not that big of a deal. Come on, God, you really need to show me something. But you see, the thing is, Cornelius didn't brush off God's voice and his word in his life as being, uh, it's, you know, if you follow it or you don't, it doesn't matter. How many of us approach God's word with such a kind of loose feel? When it comes to God's word, the Lord kind of speaks into us, hoping that we would receive a new light. You know, when you kind of wander in a season of almost spiritual darkness, you know the quickest way to get out of your spiritual darkness is to obey what you heard in the dark and follow it when the light emerges. God wants to reveal more and more of himself. He wants to give you new light. He wants to help you grow in your faith, to elevate who you and your family are and influence in a community. But when parents, when you and I, single people, students, married couples, grandparents, just kind of anyone here, when we brush aside God's word and his voice in our life and say, eh, you don't have to wonder why we're struggling in so many ways. Because faithfulness and obedience breeds what? God to take notice. The text says that the angel declares the Lord has noticed your faithfulness. There are many times in Scripture when God's people are noticed for their faithfulness. It doesn't mean they're not going to have troubles. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying also we're talking about salvation here. Works-based way of getting to heaven. No. No. But what I am saying is that if you want to grow and deepen in your faith, you've got to be faithful and obedient to what little the Lord shows you. He who is faithful in little will receive much. And so I ask you today, might you consider this man, this Gentile who didn't even know Jesus to be a man of faith and someone we should consider? Someone whose life actually portrays a different way of doing things that, wow, he's got something going here. But you see, it's really tough sometimes to follow after God's voice. Because sometimes we're going to look strange. People around us are going to judge us for what we're doing. They're going to say, hey, come on, man. Ease up a little bit with your kids. Hey, come on. Why are you doing that? Hey, I don't know. Some of you maybe don't like this guy, but I've enjoyed his his financial ministry, Dave Ramsey. He says, if you want to live like no one else, you've got to live like no one else. When you're sitting there and you're like, hey, listen, I can't go on vacation with you guys. Uh, we're saving. Or when you say, listen, I can't go out to eat with you, uh, eating beans and rice at home. Beans and rice? Come on, bro. Again? Some of you who are Hispanic are like, hey, 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 hey. It's a staple of our society, man. But you see, you will look strange to people sometimes when you are obedient to God's voice. Do you understand the significance of where he was being sent to go find Peter? At Simon the Tanner's house. 
This was a man who was involved with blood, animals, skins. He was not thought to be a man of high repute. And so when the angel tells him, hey, listen, go to Simon the Tanner's house and find this man named Peter there, it's like, are you? Could it be like the prince's house or the princess's place? Like, is there some nice person? No, I want you to go to this place, a place that you might have your soldiers and servants go to that might cause embarrassment. But God, why would you have us kind of love on these people? Why would you have us care for these people? That, it would be an embarrassment if we sided with them. God, why? When you're obedient to the voice of God, others will not understand. When you're faithful to his word, others may get confused and want to challenge you to that. But friend, side with the voice of God. The quickest way to fight against the attacks of the devil are to be faithful in the face of trial and difficulty. Spiritual life-giving habits of your family might seem strange to others. But man, they will be the best decision you've ever made. You know, I love the Steve Green lyrics that Pastor Andy shared with me some time ago when he was here in the concert. And I, I thought about it and I looked up the lyrics. And he writes there, may the generations to come look back and find us faithful. Oh, man, we were, we were kind of switching things around because we didn't really want to cause any effect. We didn't want... Faithfulness, faithfulness. May the generations to come find faithfulness. Psalm chapter 78, verses 4 through 7 declares this idea of declaring God's blessing, the miracles of, of your life to your children, and that generations might find faith. I no longer even want to just think about my life. Man, I'm starting to think now with these kids that I want to think about the generations to come. If Jesus doesn't come back now, I pray that my children's children, children might follow after the Lord. My prayer is that the way we live today, our little home, might impact our kids so much that they choose. We'll live like this too. And listen, it's not a guarantee. You know. You know your friends. You know your own kids. You did it every way you thought the church would have you. The Bible told you to. I'm not saying there's any guarantee to anything, but what there is a guarantee of is that you have the opportunity in your life to decide how you're going to shape the habits of faithfulness that will breed God's blessing in your life in the face of adversity, even adversity in your own home. I love the story that Don Ronicar tells in a little tiny book called Inside Out. A father who had sadly gone through losing a spouse, and he had two little boys, and, you know, his little boys were really needing him a lot, and he was trying to be faithful to going to church and spending that time with them and teaching them habits that he thought would bless them. But then he started dating someone. Some years later, a lady started to come over more often. Nighttime would happen. The kids didn't know, but that lady ended up staying at the house. The next morning when the boys came up, they're like, man, she's sure here early. And those little boys challenged their father. Dad, but does God's word say that she could do that? Ooh. When your kids start calling you and I out, you know we're in trouble. But that's the kind of space that we need to be in as a society where we realize, Lord, I'm going to be faithful to you even though it's so hard. It is not easy. People are going to call me strange. They're going to look at me and they're not going to like me. I don't know if I care about being liked anymore. But I do want to lovingly care for those around me. Towards the end of the chapter in verse 25, Peter and his family sensed the moving of God and they responded in faith. Verse 33 points to the reality that this family was open to growing and deepening together. Cornelius and his family, his kids, they invited their extended family, the text says, and their friends to do what? To hear the message of Peter. The third life-giving habit that we see from this is that let your faith and action as a family shine in the ordinary things that you do so that others might come to know Jesus 
And do not be afraid to speak on behalf of the Lord. You know, some people say, hey, listen, I live my life and other people will see the love of Jesus with how I live. And you know what? I, I tell you, that is, that is true. You're right. How you live your life is the most important. Actions are way more important. I tell girls that are trying to find a guy, they're like, well, he's real nice. And boy, he's telling me about things he wants to do. And I say, listen, young lady, you don't want to marry potential. Who? You want to marry a man who has shown you with his actions all he's declaring. If he's telling you, I'm going to get better, I'll work on this, I'll do that, I get it, I get it, I get it. But you also can't assume that someone is going to do anything different than they've shown you for all these years. And so here we have this idea that you've got to also be willing to declare with your word and action who Christ is in your life, that others might know and love him. You know, Paul tells us something that we kind of don't always seem to want to talk about, but the reality is, blessed are those who proclaim the gospel. How will they hear if no one tells them? Use your life. Declare the blessing of who God is. I love how Ellen White comments on this in, in this very story in the book Acts of Apostles. She says, in his wisdom, the Lord brings those who are seeking for truth in touch with fellow beings who know the truth. It is the plan of heaven that those who have received light shall impart it to those in darkness. That is your and my call. Don't get confused with the rat race of American society. You and I continually build more, achieve more, get more degrees, get more titles, get more money, get more, get more, get more, get more. But do you have the Lord? Have you grown deeper in Jesus? There I sat with my wife and one of her mentors in the radiology department. I love this guy. Emeritus professor. He's been here for a lot of years. And Dr. Keto telling Elena, listen, what I, what I see in so many of my residents, it's an amazing thing. They are excelling, excelling, excelling in their academic knowledge. But the sad reality is that I've seen very few who've excelled in their walk with the Lord during that same time. As this is going up, he said, then this other part of their life is going down. Do not leave this place, this institution, with your diploma and leave Jesus here with you. Don't leave him behind. Take him in greater faithfulness because you were here on this campus. Walk in greater faithfulness with the Lord as you start achieving great things for the kingdom because you're blessed to be a blessing. You're not just blessed just to have more. Materialism, consumerism isn't what our aim is. It is to really, truly, and faithfully build up a kingdom culture with your family. That your kids, your in-laws, that your brothers and sisters, you would be a culture-impacting community. Listen, we are called to be living testimonies of God's power in society around us. Living testimonies. Declaring to people Jesus' very own words there in Luke's gospel. Teach and preach the repentance of sin and let it be proclaimed to all the nations. Verse 48 of chapter 24. You are my witnesses, he says. Let your life so shine before men that they might see your good works and honor your Father in heaven. So when we see that it feels like nothing in our home is changing, nothing in our lives seems to be changing, man, I'm pastor, I'm not really growing. My kids don't really feel interested in this. My wife, she's not even in faith with me. Pastor, we're struggling. We got these things going on. I don't know if anything will ever change. Brother, your job is to develop godly habits consistency with the Lord, and you leave the results into his hands. The Holy Spirit is a more powerful agent of change than anybody or anything else. And so I want to leave you with a couple more quotes here that I just thought were just so profound. One more quote from Ellen White, now this time in Adventist home, and she says, the greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. This will recommend to the truth as nothing else can. 
for it is a living witness of its practical power upon the heart. The neighborhood in which they live is helped, for in it they have enriched for time and for eternity. The whole family is engaged in the service of the master, and by their godly example, others are inspired to be faithful and true to God in dealing with his flock. You see, you and I, in the way we live our life, man, it's a blessing because it changes the neighborhoods that you live in. I'm praying for you, friends. I'm praying that you won't give up. I'm praying that when you feel as though there's no hope that anything is going to change, both in your personal life, your family life, your marriage, your friendships, that you would recognize that God is calling you to still remain faithful. In this school year, as you're looking forward to what is to come for many families who are dealing with, hey, kids going to school, that those of you who have no children maybe around, that you would love on those young families, those kids with teenagers that are struggling. I was in the parenting Sabbath school. If you're not in it, man, you got to join it if you're wondering about a nice Sabbath school, SOS, second floor of the kids' wing. And just hearing the cries of parents as they yearn for their children. Don't give up. I like how one thoughtful author said, the gospel is not about making bad people moral, but about making dead people come alive. You might have experienced the death of the lion's enemy roar in your life, and you feel like some things are dead and gone. But I want to promise you that Jesus brings dead things back to life. That's the kind of God we serve. And so, friends, this morning I encourage you, Choose to build your life by life-giving habits. Amazing God, your people here have heard your word. It wasn't easy to declare, and I know it wasn't easy to hear because I feel the conviction of my own life, my parenting, my marriage, the way I'm going about things. God, I need change. And Lord, I know that your people sense that in their own hearts. Jesus, whether... We know it or not, your mercy and your grace are for us. You see the struggles that we're in and you say, friend, I'm here with you in the thick of it. I am your partner in all of this. And so, God, I pray that you would embolden your people. May they sense your peace today as they leave. And may they be encouraged to never give up. In Jesus' name, amen.